All right, welcome everybody. We are here to talk about uh, third-party risk management. You'll see that I noted this as the overlooked security risk. Uh, really, that just means the business has a tendency to overlook third-party risk and what it can do to the business. So we'll get into that um, a little bit later. So a little about me. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I traveled here to be at uh, Charleston. I uh, got two kids and I'm married. One of my kids wrestles, so we're in wrestling season right now. Good stuff. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had the pleasure. It's, I think it's mainly a northern thing. Um, it gets really intense. So uh, a little more on the professional side, though. I am a GRC consultant. So I work with governance, risk, and compliance to help companies build security programs based on whatever frameworks that they need. Um, so I do a lot of policy writing, program building, um, being an advisor to them. I have my master's in cybersecurity and information assurance. So when I got my master's, I did a lot of red team work, a little bit of blue team, and just a sprinkling of GRC. So I have a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, I have my bachelor's in advanced networking. Uh, I was a network engineer for quite some time. So in order to be in security, you kind of have to know all these different things. Okay. So you'll see I have 13 years in IT. I'm so old. I joined the Navy right when I turned 18. So I'm in my young 30s now. I've been in security for the last eight years. Um, and I have a lot of industry experience over retail, healthcare, um, you know, government, and higher education. So you'll see on this slide, if you guys are familiar with Prezi, you can set it up any way that you want. This is my table of contents. We're just going to kind of flip on through it. So third parties, they're everywhere. Uh, businesses nowadays, you will not find a business that does not use a third party in some sort of fashion. Um, there are consultants like me. They're doing marketing for your company. They're being service providers, SaaS. They're providing your infrastructure. Whatever it is, third parties are doing it for a majority of companies. You won't find many that will have everything in-house. And so when we talk about third-party risk, it's really important that the business understands how big of a risk this poses to them and that they're evaluating it properly. So now we're going to talk about what third-party risk management is. We've talked about how third parties are in the business. We use them a lot. Um, third parties are just going to provide services to you. So third party risk management, you're going to use a due diligence process to evaluate those vendors for their security controls. Um, the evaluation can be whatever your business deems important, but ultimately you're trying to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of any data that they may have. Um, you also, most importantly, want to help the business make risk-aware decisions. Security, we are here to advise the business. We're not here to tell them no or slow them down. We need to tell them what has the most impact to their business and help them make the right decision. And if they are moving forward with a vendor that they shouldn't move forward with, then the business needs to accept that risk. That risk doesn't come to security. It goes to the business. And also, third-party risk management, what we're talking about right now is primarily for assessing vendors providing your organization with services. Later on in the presentation, we will discuss um, if you are a consulting firm or someone providing services to a third party that's constantly being assessed, so that opposite side of third-party risk management. Any questions? No? Is anybody, um, just to kind of get an idea of who you guys are, how many of you are students? Okay. And the rest of you, you are in an organization. Are you part of a third-party risk management program right now? No? Have you ever had any insight to it? Does your organization even have one set up? No? Okay. Or are you on the flip side? Are you a company that's constantly being assessed? No? Okay. So what you're looking at right now um, is the vendor life cycle. So when you have a vendor come into your organization, it's going to start going through 
what I call the vendor life cycle. Um, every organization may call this something differently. Uh, you may think of it in a different way, but this is just what I've come to know my years of doing third party risk management. So first, you're gonna have governance. Um, like with any program, you shouldn't be running it unless you have your governance in place. So your policies, your standards, your procedures, what's gonna drive that program? Um, most people don't like doing that part of vendor risk management. They'd rather be in the technical details or doing that sort of work. Luckily, there's people like me who really do love the governance, risk, and compliance and writing up the documentation and kind of driving that program. Next, once you have your governance stood up, that's when the business really should be starting to bring in those third parties. So you have your planning phase. So whether it's procurement, um, business units, whoever it may be, they're going out to vendors and they're trying to put in you know, RFPs and understand what services they want to get from vendors. And so once they identify these vendors, that is when security steps in for the due diligence phase. In the due diligence phase, we're going to actually go into that a little more in depth. Um, right now, we will not cover the other portions just because it's not as relevant to us. Um, but I do want to talk about the life cycle so you understand it, how it applies to your organization. So after due diligence, you'll move into contract negotiation. Uh, when we talk about due diligence, you'll be able to kind of understand why the contract negotiation is really important. Ongoing monitoring. So this is not a once and done with your vendors. Unfortunately, you have to keep assessing them on a regular basis because threats are always there. They're always evolving. Um, controls constantly need to be updated. Depend depending on the framework and everything. So ongoing monitoring, and there are some regulations that drive, you know, doing it on a yearly cadence like CCI. And then once you decide you want to stop working with the vendor, you terminate that contract or you stop working with them. For termination, if you have been trading any data with the vendor, it's really important that you get a certificate of destruction. Um, that's just going to have your vendor Verify that they have, in fact, removed any data that they may have from your organization. Really important if they're working with really sensitive data. Any questions? So due diligence. Like I said, this is where security is going to live. Um, this is where we're really going to start getting to know the vendor, understanding what services they may be providing to the organization. It's called the due diligence process or whatever your organization wants to call it. So we need to understand the scope before we start doing anything with the vendor. Um, you won't be able to truly assess them and be able to read the assessment unless you know what services they're providing. So um, I have a couple items up here that I have found to be the most important to understand for the services. Data classification. This is very, very, very important. So data within your organization should be classified. If you have really sensitive data, such as PII, PHI, um, financial data, whatever it may be, you need to classify that so you know when it leaves your organization, you kind of understand what controls you want them to do to protect it. Um, data classification tends to have like three levels. It could be unconfidential, or public, um, regulated, confidential, or the military uses different classification levels. It just depends on what your organization wants. You know, the organization, the company can kind of drive all of those decisions, how they want to classify the data, how they look at it. So really important that you understand what's leaving your organization. Also, if they're going to store, transmit, process data, you need to know this, and you need to understand how they're going to do this. So that way, when they answer the questions, you can look at it and really get the full picture and understanding of what they are doing. And next, remote access. Are they going to need access into our environment? And if so, how are they going to do that? And what are we going to evaluate? Next, software as a service functionality. Software as a service, really important. That's where everything's going nowadays. Put your stuff into the cloud and that's it. But it's really important that we understand that we're also responsible for maintaining and managing all those controls that go up there. So 
you need to do access reviews and you need to, you know, make sure that people know not to do certain stuff on there. So software as a service, you need to make sure you're evaluating it and understanding how they've built their platform. Questions? All right. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so really good question. Let's look at it from two different perspectives. There's security, so we're always gonna care about the security controls and protecting the data and all that stuff that falls into our security realm. The other side of the stakeholders is the business. So the business is gonna be anybody vested in that vendor relationship. That can be you know, the VP, a business unit, it could be a manager, it could be external stakeholders. It could be the board. It just depends on, I hate saying it depends because it's such a vague answer, but it truly does depend on the nature of the vendor. So if this vendor is just coming in, they're not gonna receive any data. They're not gonna do anything but come in and consult. Okay, well that might be a lower risk vendor that the whole organization, meaning the board or whatever, may not care to know about. But what if there's a vendor that we're sending all of our PHI to so they can analyze that PHI and provide an output? Okay, well, that's a high risk vendor and the business all the way up to the board may want to know, you know, the risk associated with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It yeah, it depends. It's such a vague answer and it's a, it, I hate saying that answer because, you know, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of clarity, but in this situation, yeah. Best judgment. Okay, so now we move on to the risk assessment. You are trying to evaluate their overall security posture, and there's some level of trust that has to go between you and the vendor. Um, you have to try to trust them that they're providing you all the right answers and not trying to live in that gray area where they kind of do it, but they kind of don't. Um, so it's really hard, but it's, it gets better if you're using uh, like third party certifications or attestations to validate their responses. So a lot of times you can use a SOC 2 type 2. Um, that is more into the security controls and a third party vendor would have came in and evaluated them. The same goes for the ISO 27001. Um, I am not a fan of using that one though because if you're not being very diligent at what you're looking at, you can certify just one thing and you know that may not be applicable to the services that the vendor is providing. So it's all about really paying attention to those key details. Along with you know evaluating their posture, you have to provide them a standard questionnaire to fill in. Um, a lot of places kind of just develop it based on what they really need to know. Um, if you're struggling to figure out the type of assessment to build, I would suggest NIST cybersecurity framework and just starting to go down the line. The cybersecurity framework has a lot of controls in there that could be applicable to your organization. And you can word them in a way that you would get really good responses to. With those questionnaires though, I would advise you guys not to be too wordy with the questions. Um, I like to be mindful that not everybody answering these questionnaires is gonna be a security expert. Sometimes it's gonna be a just an IT help desk person, or it could just be um, an assistant or whoever it may be. And that unfortunately is just the name of the game. Um, that has a lot to say with their security too, if they have that sort of person, right? But I mean, it is what it is. People are trying to develop their businesses and can't always have, you know, the top notch security. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting with that line of business, you know, what in the world are you guys doing? So do you have to just distribute the data? So can you explain to me what the process is? And then when the third party, uh, when they get their data, like how does how is the data managed on that? And so when you're looking at these artifacts and things like that, you can get an idea of the scope of what your app is for. So if they don't if they're not able to defend against the pandemic, you're not looking at them like, well, I don't 
Well, I would, like I mentioned before, the NIST cybersecurity framework is a really good place to start. But the volume of questions gets really high and that in turn makes people not want to answer them. So you probably see like a really long time responses if it starts getting longer. If they do it at all. If they do it at all. Um, and there's kind of like a bunch of routes that you could take with that. If they don't do it at all, well then why are we giving them business? Why are we letting them sign the contract? And that's kind of a route that you would take with your procurement team or legal or whoever's handling the contract. Because if they're not even willing to answer the assessment, then why are we exchanging services with them? Why are we letting them continue down that path? Um, now, as far as the standardized questionnaire, that's a really tough one because a lot of organizations have a lot of different questionnaires. Um, Every organization will have, you know, their own versioning of it. And so now you have an issue with the vendors receiving 50 million different types of questionnaires instead of just the one that they can easily answer back. Um, have you ever heard of a SIG? Yeah. That's yeah. You, you use, uh, it's been something for me where, you know, you submit the person that pulls the template. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem doing those. I think, I mean, I like to have, I don't care about the person that comes back to the site, right? And I have to answer those questions. Yeah. But reviewing them, though, can be tedious. Tedious, yes. Um, how many questions do you use right now? Well, it, it, it really depends. So the SIG, the SIG life is usually ranked that a little bit lower. And I think you're helping me just think through that you probably might get some value out of Yeah. Um, I'm definitely the same questionnaires that we had because we had short for uh, short answer questions, which was you know, just like the paragraphs, or they phrased their, their answers in such a way not answering the question made it a long back and forth between the two. Yep. It gets painful for sure, uh, especially when they're marking that they don't do something. All right, well, what do you do now? Because now you have a bunch of potential risk. And so um, I worked at a major retailer in Dix. I actually stood up a program there where we built in full automation of risk assessments using a SAS. So vendor fills out the questionnaire. I already automatically score it. So, you know, based on their answers, if they were above our risk tolerance, then they would just automatically pass and I wouldn't even see them unless to verify, like, do an audit, spot check, or something. Um, but the ones that had negative responses, and too many of them, they would go through the risk acceptance process. So is that something that you've been doing with yours instead of going back and forth, just automatically putting them into a risk acceptance process and making the business accept those risks, and possibly writing those risks into the contract and making them fix it within a certain amount of time? So a lot of, a lot of factors go into it. It's... While I'm providing all of these like pointers, sitting down and really consuming the information is the most important part of it and working with the business. But the business being, what's their risk tolerance? You know, what data are they allowing to leave the building and that sort of side of it. But on the security side, working with security to figure out what questions are the most important. Are you just asking a bunch of questions? Like if you look at that question and you see the response and you're like, mm, I don't really care about that question. Should you even be asking it? Or should you only be asking those questions that are like deal breakers to your organization? Do you know what I mean? Does that help a little bit?
Yeah, I could talk with you more afterwards if you want to brainstorm on. Okay, I I live in Pittsburgh, so I have a flight to catch this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> All right. Um, so we talked about I talked about risk scoring a little bit just now, but always make sure you have constant analysis by using risk scoring. The risk scoring. Um, if you're just using high, medium, low, or whatever, that's very subjective. So I would highly suggest you getting with your peers in security and working together to risk score the questions appropriately. So that way, when they respond back, you have the right risk score. Um, like I said, it can be subjective. So you don't want to think that it's a very high when, you know, the rest of the team may think it's a medium based on compensating controls or whatever. Does that make sense? Okay, so since we kind of talked about, you know, building risk assessments, we're going to talk about it a little more in depth right now. So, like I mentioned, the NIST cybersecurity framework, my personal favorite because it just throws everything right there for you. It has all the controls. And in fact, when we get to the demo later, you will see in the demo, I do use um, the controls from this to build out some questions for you guys to see. So we also have these functional areas. So if you don't use NIST, these functional areas of the company that you're assessing should be what you're looking at in a generic sense. Um, you may end up calling it something different, uh, but governance, asset management, threat and vulnerability management, incident response and recovery, workforce management, meaning security awareness and how they're training their people, Risk management, identity and access management, situational awareness. So are they staying on top of the trends and alerting and what's going on in the Twitter world? Because everything on Twitter happens instantly and you know all the risk and everything. Um, or vendor risk management. Are they actually assessing their own vendors? Because if not, that's a problem because they could be sending your data to a third party, a fourth party to you, and now you lose extra sight of those um, risks or that data. And data protection. Are they protecting their data at rest and transit? These are all, those areas are what you're trying to figure out what they're doing at their organization. So you want to ask questions that are going to let you know if they're doing these main things. And all these can be mapped to NIST in some sort of fashion. In fact, they could probably be mapped to any framework that you pick, it just depending on the wording that they use. Questions? All right, so now we're gonna talk about findings. You have the scope, you've done the risk assessment, well now you have the findings. What do you do with those? You need to communicate them to the business. Um, the business, like I mentioned before, is the ultimate decision makers when it comes to the vendors. Um, they should always be making the decision whether or not to be moving forward with the vendor. They should own that risk because I'm not doing anything with the vendor. I'm not transferring data with the vendor. I'm just assessing them and providing you uh, an opinion on what you should do or not. Most of the time, the vendors that I interact with haven't been so terrible that I'm, I tell the business not to, but there has been risks that I told the business like, this wouldn't be a smart decision. You're sending them certain data and they don't have the right controls. So when you work with the business, whoever the business may be, it could be the vendor risk manager, or I mean the vendor relationship manager, the person bringing that vendor in, could be managers, whoever. You need to clearly state the risk, issue and recommend remediation. Um, at times, Security people or technical people can be um, a little too technical when we're talking to others. Even now, sometimes I may say stuff that um, may not be in your realm of what you know. And so it's really important that we come together collaboratively and work with the business and help them understand why it's a risk and why it's so important and make them feel like they're comfortable enough to come talk to you about these things. Because we always want to make sure we're establishing a really good um, business relationship with our peers and the other parts in the business, you know? Remediation. So I mentioned whenever we first looked at the vendor life cycle that we would talk about contract negotiation. All right, so contract negotiation is going to come in right here. 
remediation. So if there's findings, you want to push it on to the vendor to fix it. But being realistic, the vendor may not have the funds, the time, or maybe they just don't want to. So if they aren't willing to remediate, write it into the contract. If you can't protect the business, talk to legal, do whatever you need to, just communicate. We have a finding. It's not being fixed. We need to document, push for them to remediate, whatever it may be. Um, I don't, I haven't had too many vendors that made like a fuss when they couldn't fix something. But if they don't have something fundamental in place, like vulnerability management or something, okay, well, that's going to be a huge lift for them to put into place. It's not going to be something that, you know, we could write over and say, hey, you need to put this in place before we do business with you. And so that escalates to a decision that the, the business needs to decide if they're okay with that risk of them not having vulnerability management in place. And at that point, as the security advisor, I would tell them that they absolutely shouldn't be transferring data with them if they don't even, you know, scan and patch like they should. But like I said, it's up to the business. All right, risk acceptance. So I was briefly touching on it just then. So any findings that cannot be remediated should be documented. Now, that's not just talking about the contract. That's talking about security. We need to keep our thumb on any risk as they relate to third parties. This can be done in a spreadsheet, it can be done you know, in a database, however you want to do it. But I would highly suggest using a consistent form. Don't just, you know, from here to there, use different forms. Keep it consistent, it'll make your life so much easier when you're looking at them later. And you should include the risk, the score, and most importantly, the reason for acceptance. Um, the business not wanting to look for a new vendor because, you know, they're in a time crunch. Is that really a good reason for acceptance? Probably not. Not to security. I would just say go look for another. But to them, it may be. So they just need to document that. Um, another reason could be maybe they're one vendor of three that only provide that particular service and it's very, like, tailored type of vendor. Okay, well, that sounds like a reasonable reason for acceptance to me. And ultimately, everything should roll up to your enterprise risk management. Your risk management committee should be briefed on these risks, high risk vendors, um, any, any vendors that aren't in your threshold for acceptance. And finally, a scorecard. So you need to have a consistent report deliverable. So you did all this work, well, what's your output? What are you providing to someone for their artifact to know? So um, this could look however you want. When I show you in the demo, I made a very, very like basic version of it, but you can make it more elaborate if you want. And you wanna communicate the key points of the assessment. What did you look at? What did you find? Um, anything concerning? Any risk acceptance? And indicate the overall vendor risk score. So. Depending on the type of scoring that you put in place of your organization, you may want to put it in there. When I worked at my previous employer, we put in um, A through F for the risk scoring. So we would have a number uh, side on security, but when the business saw it, they saw A through F. And I mean, that's kind of easy to understand. We all go through the grade system, so it's easier for them to understand. Oh, and like I already mentioned, any need for risk acceptance. Questions? No? Okay. Now, I just gave you guys so much information. I love this little girl. She reminds me of like the little meme or the little emoji. So how do you make this easier for yourself? Because I feel like I just dumped a whole bunch of data on you and it's all very vague. It's up to interpretation because each business is different. You guys have different needs for your vendors. Um, so how do you make it easy for yourself? Well, you can do that, but you gotta use automation. So that means that you have to have already kind of know what you want to do with your vendor risk management program. It's not something, actually I'm sure you probably could just 
kind of whip it together, but I would highly advise you kind of have some sort of framework in place. Like you have some sort of idea of what you want to do and how you want to move. Because automation is going to be difficult. You're going to test it and try to figure out what works for the business because you always have to work with the business and you don't want to make it difficult for them because then they're not going to want to do it. So the way I broke this out was there's two aspects that you could use for automation. Most of the time people, you know, when you say automation, everybody automatically thinks SaaS or something like that. Um, I did not go with SaaS though. I went with operating system tools. I wanted to give you guys the capability to build in automation with what you have readily available. Uh, I'm really mindful that not every organization gives security a lot of money or third party risks a lot of money. Um, so we have to be creative. We have to use spreadsheets, we have to use Outlook, we have to use whatever we have on our computer to manage this, research tools, whatever it may be. So I have some on here. You can or cannot use them. Excel, Word, Outlook, PowerShell, whatever you want to use. The world is your oyster. But it all starts with the idea. So you'll see I have a very, very poorly drawn diagram up here because when I started thinking of automation, I was lucky enough to have a SAS. And I kind of was able to build it from scratch. And so when I started thinking about how would I make automation with stuff that I have available to me, I had to draw it out. I had to think about it, what I would be telling you guys and what I would propose. So you need to know scoping. You need to give the business a way to answer the form that you want, tell you what kind of data will be transmitted, whether the vendor will store, transmit process, all those details that I mentioned before. Um, you need to provide them with a way to give you that information. But then you need to receive that information in security. So how are you going to get that? And once you have that information, how are you going to get it to the vendor? How are you going to get the assessment to them? That needs to be thought about. Next, how are you going to get it back from the vendor? How are you going to take those assessments and review it and look at the findings? And then finally, what are you going to do with the results? So all of those kind of key points that I talked about. And obviously, you can tailor it to your organization depending on what you want to see. But this is kind of like, kind of get it thinking. Like, what are you going to do? Like I said, it all starts with the idea. That was not the first revision. It was multiple revisions of that. OK. So now I'm going to pull up a demo that hopefully works. Okay. okay. Are you guys familiar with Teams at all? Microsoft Teams? I heard about it here once. I love Teams. I my company right now uses it. We have Teams so locked down. Um, super collaborative, lots of functionality. So organizations tend to go between Teams and Slack or whatever it may be. But for the purposes of this demo, I use Teams. Now, I'm going to pause it real quick. I did create this in SharePoint. I did create this in SharePoint, too. Um, just to kind of show you that you could use SharePoint or you could use Teams, whatever you want. You'll see that I built a form in here so someone can easily access it. When we go back to Teams, though, we're going to look at that form in a little more depth. Okay, so now we're in Teams. Teams, I built this so anybody in my company could go to this form and start answering questions. So that first question, who's responsible for the relationship with the vendor? I just put myself. Um, and who is the vendor? I love The Office. In fact, I just went and watched The Office musical because I love it that much. So the business uh, organization responsible is Dunder Mifflin. And the person completing the assessment will be myself. Please explain the scope of services the vendor is providing. Now, that would be more elaborate than stuff, but you guys get the point. Now, will the vendor store, transmit, and or process data outside the company? I mark yes. And I start answering these other questions. I'm going a little quick, but 
They're all the same questions that I pointed out to you in scoping. Will they have remote access? Will they be providing software as a service? And also, what I'm noting, do you guys, can you see the little tiny asterisk? Yeah. yeah, I made those required questions. So the business goes in there, they can't answer these questions, or they can't submit the form without answering the questions. Those questions are a must to be able to evaluate the vendor. And then I'm gonna hit submit. Simple enough, gives them an easy way to let you know there's a vendor that you need to evaluate. Um, it didn't seem overly complicated, which was my goal. I didn't want to frustrate the business or make it difficult to, for them to actually do this work. I wanna make it like, oh, those questions were easy to answer. I won't mind doing it the next time I have a vendor. So now I will get that response to my email. So it comes up in a handy little form. It just says, you know, you have a new scoping form and you could click on it to view the results. So you'll see right here, I'm clicking on it. It took me 42 seconds to answer that. Hopefully it's the person that really does answer. It takes a little bit longer, um, but it'll show you all the statistics as they relate to that question. Now, for the purposes of this demo, I will open it up in Excel because I'm gonna use macros in Excel to make my life a little bit easier with the automation. Okay, so this is the data that's all pulled out. Now what I'm gonna show you is that I've built these forms and essentially it's the same form that you just saw, but I'm putting it all in one centralized location. So you'll see that, you know, this vendor has all their data in there. And I apologize, this is my B-Size Cleveland vendor because I did not update this video after I presented there. Sorry, I would have made you guys a custom one, but time got away from me. I have a questionnaire in here and I go through the different categories. Like I said before, the control references come straight from this cybersecurity framework. That's what's really nice about that framework is they tell you all the controls right there and what they point to in relation to your question. So if anybody gives you issues about it, well, you could be, you could just say it's industry best practice. Those are the controls. You'll see that responses are blank. Those will be populated. And there's my risk scoring. My risk scoring, um, that's based on your organization. So very highs are 20s, highs are 10s, whatever you deem them to be. And next you'll see, this is my scorecard. It's completely bank blank because we have not yet answered anything. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use a macro to import this data in my centralized repository. So it's blank, I'm gonna just pull all the data in. That is the vendor contact information, we will need that. So now what we're gonna do is email the vendor um, the risk assessment. And what I also did, if you are sending out a lot of emails, you probably have your canned, can you answer this, can you do this? Within Outlook, you can create a macro that pulls up the email, the template with the attachment. All you gotta do is throw the email that you want it to go to. So if you're sending a lot of emails and you're just constantly copy and pasting, you can use this as a method to kind of make your life easier. So I have myself automatically CC'd, but you could CC the security group, whoever you want. Um, you'll see it has the attachment already in there and all I gotta do is send. This will come to me because obviously I'm just answering all the questions and I'm doing the whole demo. It will take a minute to pop up. So now I'm gonna open it up. I am pretending to be the vendor. And I do have to make it bigger for you because you cannot read little tiny ant font. Save it. Don't mind my little blackouts. There was some data there that you should not see. You can name it whatever you want. The vendor's gonna name it whatever they want. 
So now we're going to go through the questions. Does your company have a vulnerability management program? Does your company have a patch program in place? Does your company maintain an asset inventory? All the questions that we normally hear that we're accustomed to seeing on a risk assessment. Nothing too special, but I will note, do you guys recall me saying provide them a little more information so they can answer this? Um, I provide additional information, so if they are unsure what you're getting at, what it means, it's just a little blurb that they can read. Um, in the past, when I built this into a SAS, what I did was um, have a little information bubble. So if they cursed over it, then they could see the information and it all wasn't in their face. But I figured this was a good alternative. Do they have flow diagrams? Also another really important one. Do they have an information security policy? A lot of companies do not, surprisingly. All right, so now I'm gonna go through the responses. I'm gonna answer them just like the vendor would. Hopefully your vendor provides um, a response to the stuff that they mark no, so that way you have a good idea of what they're doing. If not, you'll just have to communicate with them. I'm going to skip that because I think you guys understand. Okay, so now I am going to email the vendor, or I'm sorry, email myself back the risk assessment questionnaire. You can also use a macro to pull out that assessment and put it into a folder that you want to store it in. So it's really important that we're keeping all these things in one central location so it's easy um, to deal with. So now you can click on the attachment, save it or whatever, but you still have to take all the steps to do it. What I'm going to do is just hit this save macro, um, save attachment macro that I've created. And now that attachment goes to the place that I've stored it and I can still open it from that location. All right, so now I have the responses. What am I gonna do now? Well, I'm gonna put it back into my little central repository that I want for that vendor. So that way, if I ever have any questions about the one particular vendor, I can pull up their data. All right, now, right here, you'll see that it automatically did the scoring. So the logic was built in that if they answered yes, they got zero points, but if they had no, they got the points associated with that risk score. Um, so now they have a total of 11. Depending on your organization, that may be okay. Um, again, it goes back to whatever you guys decide or works best for you. Now, here it populated my scorecard. It gave them a risk grade of medium. And I also want to pull in those identified risks. So, like I mentioned before, we want to make sure the business understands what all those risks are, or at least they know of them. So, this is a very, like, very, very tuned down version of a scorecard, but it gives you the general idea of what you can do. So now what I'm also gonna do is just make it into a PDF. And um, when I clicked on that macro up there, it saved it to a PDF to my desktop. So now I have it ready to give to whoever. Now granted, if you were doing these on a one by one basis, creating that PDF probably would be super easy. But I'm talking about you're doing like 30 assessments a day. You're doing like, you're looking at a whole lot of them. What are these little tiny things that we can do just to minimize the impact to your day and kind of make your, day, your life a little bit easier? So what you'll see right here before I paused it, you'll see now that that attachment is already on my desktop. Um, I'll click it open and it'll be the same data that was just on the scorecard in the spreadsheet and not very pretty. And that is that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, let me get this down again because there's still more to my presentation. All right, so the demo. Really, 
like very very like basic stuff what i'm trying to get at though is you could be really creative with what you have and make something that works for you um make your life a little bit easier you know work on it an hour a day till you figure out what works all right does anybody have any questions about third-party risk management because i'm going to flip to the other side i'm going to talk about the people that you're assessing or if you're one of the people being assessed a lot so any questions on third party you you'll wait <laughs> all right so reverse third-party risk management um my boss and i came up with this title because we couldn't quite figure out what to call it now everybody's always so concerned about assessing their third parties which you should be you should be very concerned about that but what about the flip side what about the people that are constantly being assessed because now they're getting bogged down with a lot of questionnaires and that they really want to try to get them answered it's just they don't know how to manage them so this question always comes up and I never have a good answer. I'm sorry, I apologize now. But the purpose of reverse third party management is to reduce the burden of inbound questionnaires. So they don't want to just not answer them. They still want to answer them. But how do they reduce that burden so they can answer those questions in an appropriate time frame? Because you guys don't want to be waiting two weeks and they don't want to be sitting on it forever. Next. You want to, they want to minimize their response time. So again, they don't want to be sitting on it for weeks because they realize if they sit on it a long time, that could be impacting the business moving forward with that relationship. And so if you are in a position where you need to put in third party risk management, reverse third party risk management, you should build it in conjunction with your current governance document. So that way, when you get the questions in, you can start aligning to what you already do. Now, there are some frameworks or, I'm sorry, industries or high trust. Let me just use that example. High trust recently, um, hospitals that have high trust certification are pushing for their third parties to get that. Kind of makes it a little bit easier because now, okay, we're all in the same playing field. We all know that we need to get high trust. Now, granted, high trust is a beast and there's so many things they have to do within it. But now your third parties know what they need to do and there's no question around it. They just have to get certified. It's in my pain, but I mean, it kind of makes life a little bit easier because right now your third parties are getting questionnaires from 50 different people and they're trying to answer them all and it's difficult. Unfortunately, on their side, they haven't quite grasped the concept that they need a third party management office. If you're offering services to somebody, you need to make sure that you're ready to answer those questions when they come in on how you're going to protect the data. So third party risk management typically have those questions through that in here. So hopefully if anybody in the audience is in that sort of position, then maybe we could talk about it a little bit more. If not, then it's all good. And now the wrap up. Um, you can reach me at any of these. I don't really use the Twitter a whole lot. I do have a handle though, because you should have that in security apparently. I don't like the interwebs apparently. Um, I have LinkedIn and I have email, which I always answer because I do use my email, unfortunately for work purposes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope you guys leave a little more aware about what third party risk is and how you should be managing it. and. Hopefully I'm able to answer any questions that you may have. Um, it's all subjective when you think about what your organization needs. So um, if I could help you think about it a little bit, then I did my job. All right. Thank you guys. <laughs>